orderly expect and kind of going from one thing to the other to come. Is that the way these novels work? And the way I like to work anyway, so I don't see any reason to make a few questions at the moment. So anyway, these are people and who wrote in France uh, in what they call novels. Some people claim it's not even a novel. In the 50s and early 60s. By the middle 60s, people see it changing. Uh, some new novelists come in. I mean, that means that's just plain old new as in more uh, others later novelists come in. And the people who are writing in the 50s sort of start writing the same way this new group writes in the 60s. Some of these same people here, especially the latter couple, are, are still at it. And they, they don't write anywhere near like they wrote in the beginning. I mean, these are the five I'll talk about in a minute. The five particular works. Uh, I generally consider to be about as representative as any, but then that's personal opinion too. And just for fun, I thought I'd read you a few good quotes from people here and there. First by uh, René Shaw, who was a French poet of the early part of the 20th century, who says that the observation and commentaries about a poem can be profound, strange, brilliant, likely, whatever, but they, they can never avoid reducing to a signification or meaning or project a phenomenon which has no other reason of being except to be. If you think the French novels are strange these days, you should read some of the French critics and poets. Uh, next, uh, we'll go back a little bit to Blake, who was so incredibly modern sometimes. Uh, I must create a system for being slaved by another man's, another man's system, which was echoed by uh, Philippe Solers, who was sort of the big gun of, of the new-new school now. He who will not write shall be written. It's kind of clever. And then uh, one of my favorites, Proust, who was about the main French predecessor of this crowd. We only know what we are obliged to recreate in our own minds. And Sartre, who I'm not that fond of, but who um, coined the, uh, the other word that referred to this group, the anti-novel, writing about not least I was back in the middle 40s somewhere. It's a question of challenging the novel through itself, of destroying it in front of us at the same time as seeming to be building it, of writing the novel of a novel which cannot be written. These strange, difficult to classify works are not evidence of the weakness of novel form. They simply indicate that we are living in an age of reflection and that the novel is engaged in reflecting on itself. So much for a few interesting little quotes. Uh, I think you'll see how they fit as we go on. The uh, background of this is, of course, uh, literary and non-literary. Non-literary, uh, the main things seem to be uh, the other arts, uh, society, and especially the wars, and the developments in physics. Relativity uh, sort of really got the French novelists going. Uh, you'll see it hung up there all the time. They apparently were just waiting for somebody to destroy every day ABC type time, and they, they've really taken it apart. The other thing is indeterminacy, the idea that you can never really fix anything. And uh, you'll see these novels are completely that way. It is open to whatever the reader wants to work into. Uh, the wars especially, and the, the different things, the bomb, the, the world's seeming to fall apart, and we many people saw it. The old world changing, all these things that you keep hearing, the discontinuous, ambiguous, or whatever universe that we live in. This is echoed quite strongly in these novels. They were also quite jealous of the, the other arts, since uh, painting you know, became modern around, around the turn of the century. Uh, music did too. Music and painting have both thrown off all the old classical uh, rules and everything, and have got their own new systems now, whereas the novel doesn't. And people are still write novels exactly the way Balzac and Hugo and Dickens and everybody wrote them, even further back, if you, if you like. Uh, Nobody really has ever taught Don Quixote. Uh, and they're still writing the same type of book. And people get tired of this. Anyway, these old frameworks that seem to have always existed, a lot of people saw as breaking down and a new world springing up, but they were still writing the same type of novels. They decided, uh -huh, we're not going to do it. And they started looking back for literary uh, predecessors. And they came up with some people around the uh, late 19th century. Flaubert was the first novelist any of these people will really talk about as modern. Uh, some of the poets that turn the century, Mallarmé especially, 
who uh, told one of his aspiring young students that uh, who came running up with a great, great idea for a new poem that you don't write poems with ideas, you write them with words, uh, which is found quite an echo later. Uh, Valéry, who was sort of Malamé's main disciple, uh, came up with the title for us, Mohiak's novel, and did a lot of sort of intellectual thinking for this. Uh, poetry by the 19 teens and 20s had just exploded in France with Dada and surrealism and everything. And people like Eliot were run, running around, and the poets were trying all sorts of new things. Uh, surrealism was just completely opened all the doors. And, uh, the novel was still plugging along. Uh, the theater, too, started finally getting renovated, especially with what they call the Theater of the Absurd the last 20 some odd years. But the poor old novel is still just back where it ever was. And he got a couple of predecessors in France, uh, Proust in the teens and early 20s, with this huge novel about the main subject of which is the writing of the novel, and the other subject being time. And these are, without a doubt, two main themes of all these novels I'll be talking about, too. Uh, Beckett, who joined in the Theory of the Absurd move, movement, but started writing novels in 30, uh, 38, first in English and then in French. His novels have a lot of the characters of these new novels, although he sort of died out as a novelist, stopped writing a lot, about the time this school started going. But these characters of his, who have no past existence, who sort of invent their own life as they go along, their main life, their main action are the words that they speak. They sort of bounce from one word to the next. And there's, there's no doubt at all that it's fiction, that there's no you know, great cover-up for the fact that this isn't real. It's, yeah, you know it's, you know, it's fiction. And then Joyce, um, back to Ireland again, back at somewhat in that area, who is, gets, gets, gets more ink than any of the predecessors, uh, for Ulysses especially. The main thing he did, I guess, was along with the stream of consciousness and everything, is that uh, he took the structure of another book, of, of Homer's Ulysses, and used that to work all of his blooms and Daedaluses into it. And since there's no real plot, in a way, to the Daedalus bloom episodes, he takes the plot of Homer to uh, put it together, some sort of structure. A lot of arithmetic games and everything, things, you know. Uh, but the, by the way, the time is reduced to such a short time, and so much happens in a short time, he sort of uh, gets toward the simultaneity of time that the new novelists are working toward. The shifts in the point of view, the interior monologue, the different levels of discourse wandering through, the verbal games and experiments, uh, all these type of things. Uh, people picked up from Joyce. Uh, Faulkner is the other English language influence, uh, The Sound and the Fury especially. I've hardly ever seen a February French novel that's some reference to The Sound and the Fury. They just, uh, I think they, they love the title more than anything. It's a clever title. But this type of novel, you don't really know who, whom they're talking about, which Compton it is or whatever, they just uh, kind of wander. They like that. Uh, Kafka in Germany, the, uh, the trial especially. The idea of kind of waking and dreaming at the same time and loss of orientation, metamorphosis, this type of idea was big. So with influences like that, they uh, started trying to create a new novel. And what they were trying to do, as in, upon breaking away from the past, uh, they get really upset when people keep criticizing their novels along the standards of the 19th century. They see the, the novel as a 19th century bourgeois phenomenon, which was great in its time. Uh, they say, if you're gonna write like Le or like Balzac, well, then you gotta live in their time just don't do it in the 20th century anymore. They claim to be much more realistic than the than so-called realism of Dickens and, and Balzac and everybody. First of all, they want to expose what is called literary realism as just a pure convention. This idea of the omniscient author coming in, telling you everything that happens, taking you along step by step, knowing everything that each character does, and you know, good old Dickensian form, bringing every, everybody right back together at the end so that everything's nice. And so and so marries so and so, so and so goes here, everything's over, okay, it's all clear, boom, over, finished. One little, you know, the life of, Charles, of David Copperfield starts and ends in that book. And uh, according, according to Dickens, if you read it, he, the guy really existed. There's, there's no hint that, that Copperfield is a, is a um, fictional character. All these stereotypes they started getting at, and they started questioning reality the same way the physicists had. They weren't real sure that what we claim to be reality is really reality. They sort of, being good French Cartesians, think a lot of it's up here. And that the idea is 
not to describe reality, or describe what you see, but to invent it by taking what's out there, putting it into your mind, restructuring it, reordering it, and coming out with something of your own. Uh, Cruise beat into that. I have something to join, I guess. But the, the, the critics talk about the personal necessity of the free mind versus the contingent world of this haphazard facts, and imposing some sort of order on the outside. What they do is take all these elements that are there, that people can see, feel, or whatever, and take them in, soak them in, sh sh shake them up, rearrange them, take the ones they want, and make some sort of creation out of it. They do the same thing with language. They don't treat language as terribly sacred anymore. They just take parts of it, play with it, rearrange them, bounce one word to the next, and work with it. They're very big on reason and consciousness. There's not much instinct and emotion left. Romanticism was pretty much gone. You you'll see fear and love and jealousy and everything in these things. But um, fear, for example, is not described as some great welling up inside. It's described as the creak of a door or, or, or something like this. And there'll be a very detailed description of the creak of a door. And that's all. And if you, the reader, think that would cause some character to be afraid, OK, that's fear. But there's no mention of fear in the novel. Then they get the time. Uh, they've been very jealous of mu music and and painting, especially because these are spatial forms. Because you can, you can look, have a painting and everything there together at the same time. Uh, with music, you can get four or five voices going at the same time. And you, you, the ear can somewhat assimilate all these at the same time. But with, with, with words, you can't do it. You've got you know, one comes after the next, and that's it. And you, I don't know if you ever tried to write a fugue in, in, in language, but it doesn't work. You can't have four or five different things going at the same time. The ear and the eye just didn't quite take clever yet. Maybe someday it will be, but not now. So they start working with time, trying to make everything immediate and present. Uh, some of them even give up on tenses, write everything in the present parcel. It's up to you to decide what comes first. Now, the, uh, the point of this is that cause and effect is now a bunch of crap. Uh, past is what the only time they, they believe in is the time up here. Now, I. So I think back on my past, you think back on your past, you don't see it exactly as it happened chronologically. You may see your 40th birthday before your 30th, or whatever. You may see, you, you probably think of yesterday before you think of a month ago or something. And you can rearrange these things any way you want. And you do, it's by hazard, by bouncing from one association to the next. And there's no little perfect chronological order going through there. That's what they call phenomenological time. The phenomenology, never could say it, school of uh, philosophy with the Melon Ponty and all the people in France who uh, work with phenomena and just with those individually. This, this phenomen phenomenological time is an individual time. Your individual experience is the only thing that dictates chronology. You reorder the past through your memory and your imagination and do something with it. Another goal thereafter is sort of reader-writer cooperation. The writer is no longer omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing. He's just putting things there. And the reader is the one who puts them together, who draws the conclusions. It's, it's like a detective novel, except that the reader is a detective and not whoever the hero is. You, you don't have McVeigh wandering through putting it all together for you. You just have the, the clues that McVeigh would see in a novel, or that Perry Mason would see, and, and, and you make the conclusion you want out of it. And there are usually several that can come out of it. The idea is that everybody should be a creator, not just the, the writer. But you should force the reader to organize, form his own world, uh, take the framework that is given him, and then make his own detailed picture out of it. Uh, if you read a Huckleberry novel, for example, you will uh, see nothing but description. And being a good Dickensian, Balzacian reader, you just skip the description. Well, if you do this in, in Huckleberry, you, you come to the last page before you start reading. But that's all it is. The description is there, and then you work with it. He, he claims that if you read his novels that way, skipping over the frame until you come to the picture, you know, you're not going to find anything. It's just frame. So that's enough of generalities, I think. A little more specific about what these people are up to and how they're doing it. Uh, you've probably heard that there's no plot, no characters, no chronology. You just make things kind of fun. But the idea about not having any plot is that they're interested in, in telling about it, not describing it. They're not interested in what happened so much as the idea of describing how it happened. 
the same thing with the process of reading, especially the more contemporary people are really big on the idea of how the reader reads as he goes along, how he comes into contact with the text, how he changes it and then influences it in his own terms. Just like the physicist looking in at, at the atom messes it up himself, the reader does the same to the text. The text is never the same after the uh, reader gets a hold of it. Jose Luis is one of the first. When somebody asked him what this meant, he said, you know, whatever you want it to mean, it's yours, it's not mine, I wrote it. Uh, a lot of his poems were literally ripped off his desk. He would never give them up, he just kept working on them. And once, but once it was out, published, it wasn't his anymore, it was, it was whoever read it. So, that type of idea, you know, cause and effect, I've already mentioned, that's just gone. That they don't believe in that anymore. You can make up your own if you want to, but they're not gonna give you much straightforward in the novel. If there's any plot at all, it's usually invented by the character or by the reader. There's, there's, there's plenty of plots that, that you can make up, but there aren't, there's not going to be any one plot laid out there. Except in a few cases, uh, the Hoetzel Planetarium being one, where the, the exterior plot serves as a framework, and everything else is what she's really driving at. Most of it's the other way around. You've got some other kind of artificial framework and no plot, and you work with that. She uses the framework sometimes for a plot. Uh, the plot for framework, sorry, and then uh, goes down from there. So then she's a little different, at least compared to the others. Uh, there aren't many illusions in these things. Puzzles all over the place, but puzzles that can usually be solved. Maybe not in this one way, but it can be solved. Everything's there that you need. And so that's about all the plot you have. Character-wise, uh, Proust said that people only exist in the minds of others. That our, pers our personality is a creation of everybody else. And I only exist in here through the eyes and minds of all of you. I, mean, I know what I'm saying, but then you, you're, you probably all got so many different ideas of what's going on up here. And that's the way I really exist, is in you, not in me. So this is where the characters appear in the new novels, through the minds of the other people or through the minds of the reader. They rarely have names. If they do, you use a first name or an abbreviation or something like that. Uh, and they never describe just so you know what they look like. That's, they don't bother with that. Or, or they'll play with you. Beckett will start saying, uh, well, let's see, this guy had, had long hair. I don't know. Why am I fool with that? And forget it. And, or, or I'll describe me if you want me to, or something like this. But they don't care what they look like. That's thing enough to you. But then, but then they get into descriptions, we'll get to that later, which are so minute of objects and stuff that, that they'll drive you up the wall. It makes the balls awkward like, like a, a guy who never bothered with the background at all. Uh, chronology is, as I said, imposed only by the mind, this personal experience. And you get several different levels going quite often in these novels. You get the time of writing, which is always quite aware, you're always quite aware of that, because the novelist usually tell you, telling you what he's doing as he goes along. You kind of talk to the novelist off and on. So you have the time of writing, and somewhere back here you have the time of whatever he's talking about happening, and he quite often has several things in the middle. In one of Butoff's novels, he's writing his diary. And he's writing on June the 3rd about what he thought on June the 1st as he was writing on June 1st about May the 1st. And but on June 3rd, he, he's going to start writing about, about May the 3rd. But first, he's going to tell you what he thought June 1st as he wrote about May 1st. And this is where the, you get by getting a fugue on what's going through this intertextuality. But the trick is you've got to destroy all sorts of cause and effect chronological time before you can put it all together. Or else it, People just can say this one, this one's first, this one's second, this one's third. Uh, descriptions, they are, are a while. The book we gave will spend pages describing a slice of, of a tomato, or uh, or he's in the famous one of a, of, of a coffee pot. But the idea is not to describe this thing because you want to describe this thing, but because in describing it, you get rid of everything else. If, if you describe the coffee pot from one angle, then that only wipes out the other angles of the coffee pot, but also wipes out everything else in the room if you don't describe it. And you're also able, the, the, the writer is, to hone some person in on one aspect that's really uh, essential to it. Now they're only concerned with what people can take into their minds through the senses. Uh, as I said, when it comes to describing fear, you, you describe whatever the stimulus of the sphere, of, of the fear is. You don't describe the emotion of fear itself. You just describe what causes it. And you leave it up to the, to the reader and say, oh, that, that must be fear. Or in Great uh, by the guy will, will give you down to the millimeter how far apart 
this woman and this man's hands are. And then, uh, if you figure that's supposed to mean he's jealous because they're so close, but there's some idea of passion and love in there, uh, great. If you don't, great. Uh, take it as you will. None of this faint like the famous scene in Who's in Love, it's not all, where he goes to pages describing how, how the hands come closer and closer and finally the stroke of ten that they grab. But the hands will never grab. They will just be there, not moving one way or the other, and you take it from there. There's another description of a, a woman combing her hair, which we've seen in commercials, novels, movies, everywhere, as a sort of sensuous act. You have hair back down to here, and this beautiful woman you know, combing the sparkling hair and everything. Uh, so we read goes to this in La Jalousie for about two pages. And it's just the most scientific, non-erotic description you can ever see. But it's obviously, well, obviously, I guess, intended to be erotic. But there's nothing whatsoever erotic in it. You, you just read it into it as, as you will. And then what he does the next time, he'll uh, describe this with a slight variant in it so that you move from, that serves as the link from one episode to the next. Like to be in a different room or something, maybe left and right or something like that. We'll get to that in a minute. They don't believe in analogies, uh, any sort of, uh, you, know, you don't describe uh, the watch because you're talking about time. You describe the watch because you're talking about glass and metal and wheels and stuff. Uh, they firmly believe that the only thing, you, way you can know something is from one person's point of view. I mean, I only know whatever I see out there from my point of view. My experience, my capabilities, everything else. My loudly vision of what? Uh, you, you can't see everything. like. That's, that's why they don't go writing like Dickens, showing you everything that David Copperfield thought and felt. All you see is the outside, and you only see it from one point of view, and that's the only point of view that they're gonna give you in the novel. Again, they're not describing reality or anything, they're creating it, at least they're trying to. Then, after all of this, with uh, just a whole bunch of sort of aimless descriptions, they've caught pure hell from the critics. No chronology, no characters, no plot. You come to the problem of how the novel you know, fits together, how it works. Uh, people claim they don't. Uh, but if you, if you don't buy that, you start looking for their form. Sometimes it'll be uh, pure formalism. Uh, numbers, little games, uh, squares, diamonds. Uh, uh, see most of the little drawn works with the base of spades are clubs. You start off this way, and you draw the three uh, leaves, and then you come back to here for the second time, and the third time, and then the fourth time. And you can't draw that figure without passing through there four times. So he has, so he has one, one uh, object in the novel, which the characters come through four times, and that's what the thing centers on. All those are great little games like this. Uh, or you can do like Joyce did, and, and, and steal somebody else's framework, uh, like Homer or somebody. Or you can do like uh, Sarov does, and just write a sort of conventional plot and work with that. Uh, most of them center the novel around one place, uh, one intersection to which all sorts of people will, will pass through. That's the way the Marquise works. You've got about an hour in the life of this one intersection in Paris, or one event uh, uh, around which everything centers. And the different views people have of one event, uh, or a different moment, different time. But what Moyat does in his next novel is take He's already reduced it to from 5 to 6.30, and then he takes it down about one minute, one little thing, and, and then builds it out. Uh, much the way George does, I guess. He's like, what, 800 pages out of that one day? Uh, like that. Or, or most of them do, and, and this is the big trend now, is the centering things around language. The language is what creates the structure. Usually some sort of recurring word or phrase, what they call a structural metaphor. Uh, for example, in, uh, in La Jalousie, you have the French word serviette, which can mean a napkin or towel, depending on which way you're looking at it. And in one scene, the, uh, some guy crushes the centipede with a, uh, with a napkin that they're sitting at dinner. And then, and then a few pages later, you get the same description, except that this time the, the serviette has become, has become a, uh, a towel in a hotel room. And the couple is in, in, the, in the mind of the other guy, in bed somewhere, and, uh, and, not a, and, and so this, you'd have 50 words of the same, one or two will change, and then this will transform you from one thing to the next. Or just one word will come up again. Or they use puns, uh, 
So Mido in, in France is a um, cavalry school, and the that would be flown was about a cavalry regiment wiped out in 1940 in, in World War II. But it's also the uh, word for grind, uh, with or without an e, and he talks about something being sort of uh, kept forever and, and sort of formaldehyde eye or something in grind. And then he goes from, from the idea of Brian to the idea of Samir as a sort of conservative cavalry school. I mean, how, how good was cavalry in World War II against, against the Germans coming in with their tanks? Uh, this type of idea. Well, they get dirty, too. They use gland, which the same word, really, indeed, in French can mean a gland or an acorn. And they'll pop from some part of the body to an oak tree, and they start flying like this. But this is how you get from one thing to the next now. Uh, Beckett started this off. Uh, UNESCO, too. Just tearing cliches apart. But you get a cliche which just has one word changed. It's some, some obvious thing that everybody knows that one word's different, and that, that word will start starting off with something new. Well, you mess around with tenses. Uh, in some of the new novels, you'll, you'll get an alternating paragraph for tense, and the only unity from one thing to the next will be when the same tense comes back again. And then there's always talk about the process of writing. So many of the more contemporary ones, the whole subject is the idea of writing the novel that you're reading, uh, pushed again. And there's not much ending either. I wanted to read you a, a quote from, uh, somewhere, from La Jalousie. They're on this banana plantation, and they're listening to one of the natives whistle, a tune. And uh, whoever the narrator is, you never even get an initial for him, which is, it's, it's a he, that's about all you know because of the agreement. Uh, <laughs> Because of the peculiar nature of this kind of melody, it's difficult to determine if the song is interrupted for some fortuitous reason, or whether the tune has come to its natural conclusion. Similarly, when it begins again, it is just as sudden, as abrupt, starting a note that's hardly seen to constitute a beginning or reprise. In other places, however, something seems about to end. Everything indicates this, a gradual cadence, tranquility, the feeling that nothing remains to be said. But after the note, which should be the last one, comes another one without the least break in continuity, but the same ease than another and others following. And the hearer supposes himself transported into the heart of the poem. But at that point, everything stops without warning. The song resumes from the direction of the sheds. It is doubtless the same poem continuing. If the themes sometimes blur, if they only recur somewhat later, all the more clearly, vertically identical. Yet these repetitions, these tiny variations, halt progressions, can give rise to modifications, though barely perceptible, eventually moving quite far from the point of departure. That's the way these novels work, sort of. And they, they never end. You, it never works up to the, to the conclusion where everybody gets married. It just stops. And uh, they stop early, feel like stopping. There's no reason to stop anyway, so they just stop. Um, OK. Now we'll get down to some of the, uh, the books themselves. Uh, I put these up as representative ones. I put them in chronological order for the sake of some sort of order. Uh, jealousy. Uh, starts off with, with a pun to begin with. Uh, jealousy in French is jealousy, but it's also Venetian wine. And uh, you have this uh, this man who was telling you about his regiment sitting there, or wandering around his house on a banana plantation. And there's his wife, whose name is A, you know, A, three dots, and a man whose name is Frank. And he, we'll call the narrator he, watches. Usually, the blue slap from each blind, so he can't see everything. And uh, he's probably jealous of this woman. Now, you never really know she's his wife. You kind of assume they live in the same house. And she keeps seeing this other guy, Frank. So you kind of assume he's jealous. But again, there's no, you know, he never says jealous husband or anything. Just the, the guy's just there. And he starts going through these descriptions. And he uses this centipede episode to, as five, six times, to sort of take you from one thing to the next. And in one scene where the where A and Frank take off to go into town shopping and immediately have, have, have a have car trial, have, have to spend the night, which really sends the guy going. And he spends the he's night alone in his house. And he starts seeing this centipede all over the place, or seeing spots. And he, he sees a spot on his tablecloth, which reminds him of a spot on the wall. And this is supposed to be the Freudian thing of the virile lover smashing the centipede, which scares the woman, where the husband was too, too timid to do it or something, if you like. Uh, and none of this is ever you know, explained, it's just the facts are there. But it varies, and then pretty soon you get the idea that maybe 
but this he isn't terribly fond of Frank, but he starts almost going through death wishes. He, he describes a car crash, which never happens because they, they come back the next day. But he's sort of wishing it. Oh, you, you guess. Now, again, this is all just what I'm interpreting. It's just there presented to you. Uh, spots all of a sudden start getting kind of red and bigger and bigger. And he never mentions the word, word blood, but you start, you start to wonder. Uh, just little things like this, which is uh, just kind of, you're wandering on through. And all you ever see or read is what he uh, takes in, what he sees or imagines or remembers or something. See, past, present, and future are just gone. And you don't know what he's doing. It could be something he remembered, something they did before. It could be something he thinks they might do, or he hopes they might do, like, like a kill. Or it, uh, it could be something they're doing at the same time. But he, he'll just look through the slat and see them out on the veranda <coughs> having a drink. And he'll, he'll measure how far apart their hands are or something. And all this is sort of laid in with very detailed descriptions of the house there. So that you, you see nothing except what this man sees or feels or imagines. And when you get to the end, somewhere this kind of stops all of a sudden, you uh, stop and think, hmm, now that's probably a jealous husband trying to figure out just how much this guy and, his, and the woman, who's probably his wife, have got going. And you, and you start putting it back. You decide whether this was imagination or future or death wish or memories or fact or what. And you, you choose, and it's, up, it's there. It's up to you. And it's a great feeling, but you know you can't be wrong. Nobody can ever argue with you. There's, just, there's no one way of interpreting any of these things. That's, in a way, it's, this has turned out to be, well, these first two are going to be the most popular of the uh, new novels. The uh, Modificacion even made the best seller list almost. It sold 700,000 copies. But most of these barely sell at all. But that's one good example. In the Vito novel, which got translated either a change of heart or second thoughts, depending on which, whether you're in England or in America. The main thing he does, he writes the whole thing in, in, in the U form, the French U, the, the sort of uh, formal singular plural U. And he starts out you know, on a train trip, and he says, you are standing there with one foot on the, over the, the metal plaque about to step into the compartment of the train. And the whole novel is you this, you that, you this. The plot is incredibly conventional. And you begin to wonder why it's the novel for a while. Uh, this man, Leon, is, uh, works in Paris for an Italian typewriter company, a business machine company or something, and he goes to Italy once a month for meetings to Rome. And he's met a Roman woman, and she's become his mistress. And he has three, three bitchy kids and a nasty wife. He doesn't actually like it too much, and he, he, he just can't wait to get to Rome every month to spend the weekend with his mistress. And she's sort of incarnates Rome and the old ideal and everything else, and ancient beauty and everything else. And he comes back, he's unhappy. So finally he decides to uh, stop being bourgeois, to bring his mistress up to Paris, set her up, get her a job, leave home, and everything else. So he makes a decision, hops on a train, heads to Rome on a secret trip. He tells the, the company he's going to Rome and that's why. He, he tells his wife he's, he's going to Rome on business. He, he didn't tell the mistress he's coming. He's going to surprise her. But on the way he changes his mind, he kind of chickens out. And comes back and becomes a good husband again. Now, what more conventional plot could you want? <laughs> Except that well, there's several things that, that have messed you up. The thing I like more than anything is he comes back feeling sort of defeated because he didn't escape from his monotonous routine. So at, for revenge, he writes the novel that you've been reading. <laughs> to sort of, uh, you know, his affair is sort of over. He, he didn't even go see his mistress that trip. That's about to die. So he sort of brings it to life by writing it up. Uh, and the, the neat thing, he buys a novel in, in the station in Paris when he leaves. They, he doesn't even look at the title. He doesn't even know where the title is. His parents picks one up, flips the woman a dollar, and takes off. And he, he, he uses it to mark his seat when he, when he gets up to go to the dining car or something. You never know what it is. He never picks it up, never opens it, never looks at the title. And you get a sneaking suspicion that if this is, if this is the novel that, that you're reading, it's sitting there blank, filling up page by page the further he goes along. Uh, Oh, no, I don't know. Why worry? But he talks about this sort of machine coming on, uh, and the people in his compartment start cracking up his life, and his illusions fall apart. His illusions of Roman grandeur and his 
mistress. You know, she can't be transplanted. She doesn't work in, Rome, in, in Paris. She's sort of part of Rome. It's almost as if he had some sort of mythical goddess that he found. He, uh, we thought they were myths, too. He talks about all these different regions of his existence that are, are getting crossed up. He, he can't you know, leave this behind now and go down to his good life. They're all messed up now. And the way he gets this across is by the structure of the novel, which is basically based on the railroad timetable. It's about a 22-hour trip. He's going third class, but he's, he's going to have a expense account this time, which, which means he has really weird. Uh, if you ever try to have a third class on an Italian train, you know, you know the type of people he has sitting across from him. And he sits there bored, trying to figure out who the hell these people are. And uh, there's even a honeymoon couple, which of course really digs at him. Since he and his wife took their first honeymoon to Rome, and now he's going down there to see his mistress, and he changes his mind, all this type of thing. But every time you get to a, a stop of the train, it, it's on the timetable, that's really when a, when a scene will shift. And there, there are eight trips that work in here that he's taken in the past, either with his wife or going down to see his mistress or coming back with her when she's going back down, or something like this. And, and you jump from one to the other as the timetable and the train arrive at one station or another, and you just back and forth. And these are when all the regions of the existence start to, uh, to fall apart, to just kind of fall apart and all mix up. And then the compartment makes a very nice little structural thing. Because he, the present is only when he's in the compartment. Whenever he steps out to go to the, go eat or whatever, or you know, go get a sandwich and, or something, he, uh, he's, the narrative sort of stops. And the only real action you have is when he's in that compartment. And he has all these strange people. There's an old woman, and there's a honeymoon couple. And people come in and out, and they get off one station and get on, and things change. And, that, and they all sort of set him off on one thing or another. And he uh, goes. And uh, other than that, uh, I don't know what else to say about the novel. The plot's so incredibly simple. Uh, it's so conventional. But this structure, the time switching all around, which you have to really watch out to follow along. Uh, you, I, I forced myself to have to draw a diagram on, on the cover of the book uh, of the compartment who was sitting there so he didn't know what's going on. And uh, things like this. Uh, he sees all sorts of things out the window and, and bridges and, and, and roads cross and that sets him off on something. And, uh, like he'll be going over a bridge, you see a truck uh, going under it. By the time he gets across, it's too late and he can't see the truck coming out. And little funny things like this. Uh, there's that one. If, if these descriptions don't make any sense, I think you I hope you're beginning to guess why. Um, <laughs> what I'm doing by giving you a plot is destroying the whole novel. I'm taking all these things, you know, that have been, re been really messed up by the by the author and putting them in order, which in a way is sort of you know unfair to him. That's not the way he wanted it. But how much how much of the way I can talk about it. Uh, a brief comment about Sarlacc here, the planetarium. The planetarium is supposed to be a um, a false sky, you know, planetarium is this kind of model of the skies, and you have this sort of false exterior among which the stars move. The stars are going to be the characters. And she believes what she calls tropisms, which I understand is a bio biology word. A sort of uh, almost automatic reaction you get if you stick an amoeba with a stick or something. It kind of go like this, or any sort of action like that. It's supposed to be a tropism. I take that on faith. <laughs> I think the word exists in English too. Anyway, so she started writing in 39, I think it was, uh, a book called Tropisms, uh, revised it, added some more to it in 57. And these are about one or two pages long each. And it's, it's usually some people sitting around, and I, for example, will be looking at one of you, and we see nothing but the outside of, uh, of, your, of your face or whatever. And I may see a twitch of your hand or something, or I may see, even if you smile, I see something, or frown, I see something, or whatever. Then I Try to maybe figure out why you're doing this. And there's no great novelist to come in and explain the depths of your personality to me. I'm just looking and guessing. And then this is what she describes. And you have two levels: the um, what you see on the outside, what people are doing and saying and acting, and what they're really after. So what she does is take this kind of strange plot of um, a young married couple starting out, and three things happen. One, they're just dying to buy a Louis XV chair. Uh, but the parents wanted to buy a good, solid leather armchair. Uh, they also are trying to talk their eccentric, uh, his eccentric aunt into, into giving them her seven-eight-room apartment and taking their three-room apartment. We're not that complicated. She's got three or four switch. She's the one old eccentric woman with uh, seven rooms and, and, 
in the post-war housing shortage is illegal to begin with. And so that finally happens. And the third thing is that he is a sort of budding writer and meets a famous writer who is probably sort of a, of a takeoff on Sarah Alter's cell that she wrote in there. And he sees her for a while. And you know the thing, you know, the young budding writer meets the great established you know, writer and all this type of stuff. And you get a nice little plot running through. It's not too hard to follow. But that doesn't, that doesn't make any difference. These are the false stars in the planetarium. What she's digging at is the um, things that are causing them to say these things, act like they do, make the movements they do, and this type of idea. But she doesn't go through and describe them like a psychological novelist does. She just uh, presents the outsides in, in such a way that, that you will start getting in the inside. And the main thing she does is she'll, a, a, ch a chapter usually consists of the same thing told by seven or eight different characters. And you start homing in on it this way. You see the same event seven times. And this way you get a glimpse into each of the, uh, of the uh, characters. One of them says, oh, isn't she sweet? One of them, oh, one of them. And something like that. Uh, that's how that one works. Uh, Flanders Road is the one with the Ace of Clubs here. The, the point in Ace of Clubs being a dead horse. Uh, not terribly interesting, though. Central point. But this happened in 1940 when uh, this little cavalry regiment you know, and the, the, he rolls an old noble about three centuries late, riding off his horse, waving his saber right into the Witz Creek. And it doesn't work too well. He gets wiped out, obviously. Just so he draws his saber, some you know, machine gun cuts him down, that's the end of him. And there are only three people left out of this regiment. And they, they end up together in a, in a German prison camp. And they start trying to put things back together. Yep. Uh, partly the war episode. And they're not sure whether this uh, hero uh, committed suicide or not. You get the idea that he was, you know, so hung up on past glory that he just rolled his horse right into this thing, you know, to die a gallant death and get it over with. He saw the warfare change, the roar change, and everything else. But the other quirk is that uh, one of the three characters is his old aide, who was also a jockey because his wife liked horses and he was a cavalryman. And uh, he, was, he was apparently the wife's lover for three or four years. And there's one scene where the, uh, the husband gets jealous uh, tells the jockey that he's going to ride the horse in this race, not the jockey. And of course, he comes in second. And why says, you, know, you would have won if the jockey had won. Of course, the guy's, you know, male ego just blown. Uh, but all this is happening now when this guy named George is, is sleeping with the, the widow. He's come back after the war in 46 and seduced her. And uh, she, she'd be married in, in time being, I think. And so, Anyway, you see how time's starting to fall apart here. But you get several episodes, a few early episodes for the war, mainly the one with the horse race and the, and the love affair between the jockey and the, and, and the wife. You get different scenes in the life of the, of the, of the old noble cavalryman. You, uh, you, get, you get the battle itself when they were all killed, except for these three. And, and a couple days before, near Billiton in the farmhouse near there. And the dead horse right outside the farmhouse. But it also pops up right before uh, the guy's killed. They're all in the same area. Then you get several scenes either on the way to the prison camp or in the prison camp when, the, when these guys, they're sitting in the dark, and, and, you know, either the blacked out bus on the way to the thing or the blacked out prison camp, and they can't see. Same way the guy's lying in a dark bed with the, the widow, can't see her either. And they, and they start talking, they, they discover in the same regiment, they start you know, putting the past together. And then they didn't meet the jockey and get his story, I think. And so you get two or three of those episodes, a couple of present episodes, the battle, the billeting, a couple of earlier scenes in the um, life of this, of this hero, all kind of going in and out of George's mind as he's sleeping with the widow. And the thing that puts them together is this uh, dead horse. You see, it the first time when you first see the battle, just before he rides off and kill, they, they, they go past the carcass of this dead horse. Then it pops up twice uh, when they're billeted before the battle. And right at the end, this is the fourth time. You go one, two, three, and back to it at the end of the fourth time. As of course the last scene, you get back to the to, to the guy riding off the shot again. And it sort of clicks off. They always stick with it quite often. Uh, let's see, what other clever things happen in there? Now again, the, the things that happen aren't terribly strange, just there's no chronology to hang on to. And uh, the, um, the the narrator is trying like hell to figure out what's going on, but really can't. It's, it's too foggy. You, as, as reader, usually have a much better idea of what's going on than he did. But you can stop, play with it, put it together, and everything else. And 
again, it works on language. The way you get from one thing to the next is uh, by bouncing off a word. That somio fun was in here, and the gland fun was in here too. Right? You just bounce off one to the next, and off you go. And he'll be sitting there thinking, lying there beside this woman, and a word will come up, it's just either homonym or synonym or, or something like it, and boom, he passes off to another word, he takes him off to a different episode, and he starts working on this one. And then in the end, the little lesson he throws at you is that uh, the past and their lives basically have been shattered by time. They can't put it back together again. All the things that have happened have messed them up. It's almost sort of a uh, determinism thing, a little bit like Hardy, I guess, that these past events have destroyed his uh, present freedom. But events and, and lives and characters are destroyed, but the thing that lives is this symbol, the, the, the artistic structure of the novel. And the, and the novel and art becomes a means of, of, of knowledge and of putting things together and of holding on. One more. Uh, the Marquise. Uh, the Marquise is a fat 50 year old male homosexual, by the way, uh, who, who calls himself the Marquise in the third person. He says, Marquise don't do this, Marquise don't do that. But there's an intersection in Paris, Cap uh, Floyd Bussy, which uh, the novelist said he picked a sort of in random because he came across it once. And the neat thing about it is that it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting historical place. And he tells all the things that happened to it, not only that day, but the last 800 years. But it's so close to, to, to the really historic places in Paris. It's about you know, a couple hundred yards from the Louvre, right down the street from the Latin Quarter, and Salon, and everything else. You know, it's sort of ironic to pick that one. But he goes through uh, an hour and a half of the present life, and eight centuries of the past history of this, of this intersection. And you just pop from a, from a 13th century chronicle, which is almost always a crime or, or, or something like this. And what else can you find in the newspapers? And what else has been conserved for posterity? Or these different things that he sees. Now, you have a novelist. This, he, this is the third in a series by Moyak, but it's by the same novelist. He's a Francois Moyak's son, if you've read any of Francois. Um, where is And this guy's standing on his balcony, looking over the uh, intersection. And what's really neater is, is across the street is obviously his double, who is the old archivist, who has all these documents about things that happened last 300 years. And these are kind of mixed. In the first couple of novels, you met this guy with his society and his wife and family. The second novel is a dinner party with him and eight other people. And now it's just him. He's left his family. And as the novel starts, uh, his wife and daughter are just leaving from a visit. That's 5 o'clock. They leave. The Marquise walks out on the street. He goes to his balcony and starts watching. And then you just go into the lives of all these people who are out there, strange people. There's a bronze girl running down the street from the main club. Everybody stops and looks at There are a couple people doing this and that, shopping. There's a, a, two, a two policemen waiting for a, a couple of gangsters to meet. But, but the one gangster got the day wrong, and, and so they get with all that stuff. And these little things happen, these crazy old scurry French people wandering around the streets. And you get these, these two people you know, split across the street describing this thing. And this, uh, her name is Bernard, I think, uh, the novelist, always, will always stop to tell you that the novel he's writing from time to time. And then his alter ego will start tossing in uh, older historical tidbits about 14th century and 15th century. Uh, he also throws in a few um, Algerian war goodies, uh, which, which make the torches of the 13th century sound kind of pale, which is show that everything is, has changed a whole lot. And this goes on for a while, and then it's, uh, he doesn't really go anywhere. He stops and goes for quite a while, and then the one old man is telling another old man about his wife's death. And uh, one of the apparently main themes is that uh, you can't really talk about death. You can describe everything that's going on there, but you can't really talk about death, especially your own death. And this type of problem, which is not terribly novel either. And then uh, that's over for a while. Then you get another long sort of interior monologue a la Joyce by uh, the novelist again. And about that time, uh, uh, Moriak shows up, pops in, and starts you know, throwing all the levels at you. Here you have a novel written by a novelist who is talking about the novel he's writing, but, but, then, but then in comes the novelist himself, who has created the novelist, who's writing the novel that you read. And of course, remember, you're, you're supposed to be making the whole thing yourself as you, as you read. You're probably the supreme creator in this long list of actual writer, fictional writer, you know, what is being written, and then you who are reading it. And uh, oh, I kind of like this quote at the end. I thought I'd read that, that to you. That's the story of Bertrand, his name, which in his first version is from a single character. 
has been joined, thanks to the eight guests of its sequel, The Dinner Party, more general troops, widening and deepening in this third part, where a whole nation was raised up and perhaps resuscitated. Now, this is not a critic speaking. This is Moriac coming into his own novel. He's very nice. He tells you what's going on. The others don't. He, he usually explains it to you. Uh, here comes Faulkner. The sound still, fury faded. There remains freedom. It's kind of tongue in cheek there, I think. Thus, the novel has in its penultimate pages gradually faded away and disappeared without masks and make believe, giving way to the novelist who, if he has put himself directly in this book, has at the end purified that his last traces of fiction by granting it a truth in which little exactly was preferred to literature. And then he takes up the, the first sentence of the novel, but negates it. The Marquise did not go out of five. And uh, so much for the novel, he just kind of wipes the whole thing out. But it's there, that's what's so neat. It's not there, but it's there. And, uh, you know, fun. You may not think this is funny, I think it's crazy. Most people do. I get a big kick out of it. Okay, there are the five works. Uh, there are a lot of others. Uh, you know, by these people and by other people. And the, 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 the new people coming in the 60s and now, mostly centered around a, a, a publication in Paris called Telquet, which started up in the uh, 50s and well, it, was, it split in 71 in different political factions. But they're the ones who are really writing novels about writing novels. Uh, just, just wild. It's, you know, you know what's going on. I ain't trying to describe most to you. I try to think of a few American equivalents. It's kind of hard. There are a few Latin American writers who were copying this, but you know, the influence hasn't made it self felt over here too much, or in England. Uh, the one thing you do get compared to it is uh, Burroughs's uh, Naked Lunch, this novel about a drug, drug addict who bounces from one trip to the other by, by way of, of, of recurring words and phrases. Uh, Philip Rosslater's novel played this a little bit, the, the Great American Novel. Uh, the prologue is by a sports writer who loves alliteration. And he gives you a, a page list of words starting with B. And he just bet, 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 bets himself around. And he starts playing with language a little bit. And, and, and he steps into the novel showing you how he's writing it and everything else. And he appears in the novel from time to time. This old sports writer who was uh, uh, telling you about this old league that was really closed down by a communist plot. It's a great little book. Uh, the other thing whose novels aren't too much like it, a little bit, are John Faust. Now, the Magus was the same sort of puzzle. And his, uh, some of his essays and comments say the same thing as the new writers in France do. That uh, there aren't any more styles really to be developed now. But today's writer is a guy who's mastered all of them and is going to uh, put them all together. That's what most of these people are doing. The future seems to lie mostly in this more and more working with language system. The French critics are getting in linguistics and making a real science out of it, and really digging into how the language works. And uh, these novels now are just coming solely out of the language. And one of uh, Lucas Du's novels is published by Michel de Minuit, who have a symbol like this, um, something like that. They started doing it during the resistance. And then the idea comes in. And so he, uh, most of it, uh, well, a lot of it, it, it is about the uh, Venus, because there's a star on the cover of the novel. And he, uh, his name is Ricard Du, which has got the same, uh, half the same uh, letters as Viard who who's an old chronicler, who talked about the, 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 the conquest of content local by the Crusaders. So that's that part of it. Uh, there's also a character whose who name, name is Edward, which is, which is Ed Word, editor and Word. And just and these things all fly across. Uh, even the front and the back of the novel are the same. It's called the Frise de Constantinople, the capture. But on the back page, it's called the Prose de Constantinople, the, the prose of Constantinople. And this, this alternates page to page. Left hand page is Frise, and right hand page is Prose. It's, it's, it's just one of the best ones I ever read. Uh, anyway, that's where they're at. Uh, uh, so they also even throwing in Chinese now. He has a little Chinese symbol at the beginning of each, uh, each segment. Yeah, I guess I've got to go get a Chinese dictionary before reading that one. I tried and I think it just didn't work. Anyway, just to be honest, I thought I would start my conclusion with the problems. If you haven't guessed, they're hard to read. Uh, very few can, can, can work it after one reading. You've got to either start reading it again and get a criticism or sit down. You've got to diagram the damn thing. Uh, put all the chronology back and forth, whichever way you want. See what 
are going on, you've, you've got to start even almost counting syllables and numbers and see where number plates come in. Uh, Becker's novel, do, they all do, it's fantastic diagrams you can make if you get into it. Everything fits, the numbers play around and everything. It's as bad as, as, as this Bach. Uh, things like, uh, oh, Bach works in uh, 57 notes in, in a phrase because what he's talking about in that fashion occurred in Psalm 57. It's the same type of idea. Uh, the Baroque is incredibly close to this. If you're interested. Uh, there's also speculation that this puzzle type of literature is, is, will soon blow itself out because there aren't enough good puzzles left. Uh, but then the detective novels seem to be going strong too, so maybe, maybe not. Anyway, uh, now that I've been honest, now we'll talk about the great success of the thing, is my real conclusion. Uh, what I like about it, what most people seem to like about it, is that in a way it's sort of revolutionary. Not, not by going into politics, but by destroying old stereotypes and models and frameworks and conceptions of reality and this type of thing. But it obviously kind of blows your mind out when you start. You gotta start from scratch and work with it. Drop all your old uh, uh, stereotypes and prejudices and everything and, and, and restructure whatever is there. And this is what life seems to be about. It's taking things that you're uh, confronted with and restructuring them of your own and making something out of it. And this is what these novels are making them do. They have a value which is Fortunately, not moralistic anymore, not good or bad. Don't be like David Copperfield, not, not like David Copperfield or, or Scrooge or whatever. Uh, the, the value of these things is, is, is knowledge, mostly. You know, the truth will set you free in this type of idea. Just like for the uh, Flanders Road, you know, the life is integrated around you, but by putting something together, by writing so that you wouldn't be written, you uh, have saved something out of this whole mess that you're, uh, that you're faced with. That I think is, is, is a pretty pretty worthwhile goal. And, uh, it's more than just criticizing the old model, it's criticizing the old world, it's criticizing the old society. And this is why Telkiel split in 71. Some people were going into politics like Sartre and everybody. The others thought that, that the best way of changing society was by breaking down its conceptual hangups. And they're breaking them up. They're just destroying the language, every, you know, the art, everything, just blowing it out, just like painting and music. And uh, they're forcing people to start over. And uh, that's the revolution. One of Victor Du's short story collection is called um, Microscopic Revolutions. Short story. It might work. I don't know. It seems to work better than going out and beating somebody over here with a stick. Anymore. I guess I'll stop on that. It's been an hour. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. You want some questions? Yeah, I, I love all of that. I wonder if uh, you see these as sort of refinements of the interior monologue and in Proust and in Joyce, or would you think there really been any significant real departures from what <coughs> Proust and Joyce have done? Um, I think they've gone a lot farther. Uh, they, most of them see Proust and Joyce as kind of conventional. Even I in my see most of as conventional. The techniques, as you can, as you probably guessed, are, are pretty much the same. They're, they're just taking them farther, blowing the models open a little bit farther. And, uh, uh, and Proust at least has got a, well, some of the critics, the old critics, will say, yeah, at least in Proust and George, you had a story, you had some characters. I mean, you got great characters. I mean, you know Bloom inside and out. And, and you know all Proust's characters inside and out. But, you know, that's gone. Uh, Proust's chronology is, is pretty straightforward. And uh, so is George. I kind of slow, but it's there. They just take them a little bit further. But those two are amazing in what they came up with. Of course, a lot of that would be related to your difference between what you call phenomenological time and I think you used the term individual time. And uh, but that, that kind of confuses me because you spoke of phenomenology as the events of the world as translated by the mind, and then you spoke of individual time oh, as those two are the same. I'm sorry. Pardon? Those two are supposed to be the same. Oh they are. As opposed to chronological time. You know, Einstein time versus thought time. Acknowledging in depth the visual world. Yeah, she pops up from time to time. Uh, so I don't think it's closer to her than anyone. Uh, well, obviously, I could talk to tons of other people. There's even a, a Roussel, a French novelist at the turn of the century, who was kind of messing around with surrealism and everything. He was discovered, he was rediscovered in the 50s. He had his time, I think. Yeah, well, I think the re I think the definition of reasoning would be individuals reasoning 
no absolute left. That's one thing I maybe should have mentioned that day. Just reject all absolute standards of reasoning or right, wrong, good, bad, anything. That's all gone. You've got to make up your own as you go. You'd be an anti rational in, in that sense, anti 18th century universal absolute yeah. Newtonian rational, yeah. But, but, but you see, very rational in the other sense. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, what did you call it, objective subjectivity. It's obviously one man's, but it's so objectively, straightforwardly one's man, one man's. It works. I tend to come across that teaching of it. What do I keep coming across? Uh, just saying, uh, be as subjective as you want, as long as you're objective about it. Somebody played them, and then a couple of them, and he would say his thing, and then they go on. So I've got the record, the score in the book. I've got to get down sometimes. I put the big out and do it. Beethoven writing main novels in the book. He's playing cryptos and things like that. 